There is a, a phrase in our culture which has some rather odd origins, but has entered uh, our everyday life. And it has an entire subculture and subworld around it. And last Sabbath, we were assigned and we willingly went and visited our sister church last Sabbath in Las Vegas. The phrase meant all the more. The phrase is beating the odds. Now, it relates to blackjack, roulette, sports betting, and you want to beat the odds. Now, when you, how many of you have been to Vegas? I got more questions, I told you. Oh, come on. How many of you hit the casinos at Vegas? Yeah, all the hands go down. Yeah, sure. Okay, fine. Fine, fine. And so, now I know. None of you, none of you have ever played the lottery. You've never been to a track. You've never been to a casino. So you may not know what beating the odds means, but you have driven the LA freeways. It took four freeways for us to get to church today. And if you don't think that's playing the odds, I grew up here, I think it's playing the odds. But I don't mean to bring up the blackjack table to church, but it is a fascinating numerical concept. And today what I'd like to do is to discuss with you a subject, this fascinating area uh, of life but from a very different perspective, and obviously that is from a biblical perspective. Now, those of you that love titles, this title is numerical. It's 100 dot dot colon to one, 100 to one. In our lives, when something very strange happens, and it could be positive, but often in times it's, it's, not, it's not pleasant. It's strange, it's odd, it's unexplainable. We may say, what are the odds of this happening? It means, how could this have happened? What were the odds? I didn't plan on this. I, I didn't expect this. I, if you'd asked me uh, a year ago that this would happen, I'd say there's no possible way. In other words, the odds of it happening are so extreme. We are often struck by the change when things happen to us in our life. We don't expect young people to die young. We don't expect seemingly healthy people to get sick. We don't expect, seriously, of hitting the lottery, even if we do play, because the odds are so high. But again, none of us would ever play the lottery, I know that, or go to a casino. But when bad things happen, they are so much, we say, out of the blue. The odds are staggering against it, of it happening. We say it's the probability it seems astronomical. When it says odds, Odds, it means averages. It is truly a numerical counting. It is based on sound mathematical concepts, and it's basically a pair of numbers, pairs of numbers. There are odds for an event and odds against an event. They are surely not guaranteed, but when someone says there's a 50-50 chance, the odds are two to one, one to two, when it says it's a thousand to one odds, that means it's probably not gonna happen, or if it does happen, it only has one chance in a thousand. One chance in a hundred. Rare. Rare. We talk about getting bitten by a shark in the ocean or getting struck by lightning. Everything is related to being struck by lightning or getting bit by a shark. Very, very odd. So it means averages. Its history is rather interesting. One of the earliest references, and it's a vague reference, and we heard, uh, we heard him quoted in the, the Bible study, is in Shakespeare in Henry IV. It says, knew that we ventured on such dangerous seas that if we worked out life, it was twas 10 to one. In other words, the odds of it happening were one in 10. And that's one of the very first references. But maybe you're aware, maybe you're not aware that it has to do, these odds do, of probability. How many of you study statistics or probability? Yeah. This, this seems to be a very active side over here, and this one, you haven't really done a whole lot in your life, have you? Yeah, it's, it's, it, this is the happy, active, lively side, and you're not. <laughs> so, homework assignment, I'd like all of you on this side of the room to please go over and meet these people over there. Or better yet, because you're so lively and active on this side, you get up and go over to the very, well, I, wait a minute, I sat on that side. So, <laughs> and so, how many of you know what an actuary is? Yeah, right, sure, the three of you did. All right, an actuary is one who is trained in actuarial science, which is defined as the discipline that applies mathematical and statistical methods to assess 
risk in insurance, finance, and other industries and many other professions. I'll give you an example of what an actuary is. And, and there's quite a few of you that know what, that, what it is. It has to do with the General Conference of Elders. Uh, Mr. Fish, as you may know, is on the coordinating committee for the General Conference of Elders that we all, many, many of us attend. And he uh, set up a blackjack table at the, you didn't know that, did you? No, it didn't happen, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But during the conference, I met a, a young lady that we, we had known from another location. She came up to me and we said hi and hugged. And I said, hey, how you doing? She said, great. And, uh, she said, hey, Mr. Garnet, I'm an actuary. Do you know what that is? I said, well, in fact, I do. I said, let's walk back into the room with all the elders and some of their wives. And an actuary can predict when every one of those people is going to die. And she said, that's right. And that's what actuaries do. They do large bodies, or it's called the law of large numbers, and they can predict fairly accurately when the mass population, how long they're gonna live, what kind of occupations they're going to have, and they have to some, not so much predict, but they have to propose odds, especially in life insurance and other financial instances. Take, they take statistical factors historically and they plot different scenarios. If this were to happen, then this might happen. If these events were to take place, then these over here have a very high degree of probability or a very low degree of probability. For instance, if you drive on the 210, if you're able to drive on the 210, um, at 80 to 90 miles an hour, you have a very high probability, the low, odds are very low, in other words, it could happen, you're gonna get in a very terrible accident. That's what it means. The probability goes way up. You drive at 90 miles an hour on the 210 freeway. And so being struck by lightning has very, very, very odds against it. It's probably 10,000 to 1 against you having, being hit by light, uh, uh, lightning. Life insurance, pensions, even casinos depend heavily on, on the work of actuaries. What kind of risk is associated with what type of occupation? Because we're in Vegas, and there's, you know, there's a couple of casinos up there, you're always obviously struck by, not struck, but you're amazed at how many buildings there are. There are hundreds, big, big casinos, and little casinos, and little poker. Uh, we tried to hit most of them last Sabbath, but uh, <laughs> no, we didn't go to any of them. But there's just a lot. Those of us, many of us in this room, are involved in the financial services industry. When I was trained, and as most people were trained, you probably had a class, or we will have a class. I had a class where the instructor stood up and said, I will never forget this sentence. All insurance and financial companies are like casinos. And all casinos are like insurance and financial institutions. Do you know what that means? It means the house, what? Never loses. Never ever loses. And the reason is, they have good actuaries. They know how many people are going to do a certain type of activity. And they, yeah, you'll hit from time to time, but you won't hit all the time. And most of the people will lose, and that's what they're counting on, is that the odds will start to take effect. But you know, the odds that can affect your life insurance, your pension, your health, your life, it can affect all those things. And as we see, the odds are relative. The odds are relative to you, and the odds are relative to me. From a purely carnal, earthy, natural perspective, it's surely the odds. I want to ask you to turn there. I'm going to ask you to do some thinking. If you remember when Jesus was asked when the Tower of Siloam fell on those people and they were killed, do you remember that story in the New Testament? I see some heads nodding. He was asked, do you think these people were more evil than others? Nay, they were not. In other words, the rain falls on the just and the unjust equally. Things happen. Unfortunate things happen to even good people. And the odds that we'll be financially secure, the odds that we'll be healthy, the odds that we'll live a long life, they're just that, odds. But it also says we must do everything in our power to keep God's health laws. A, they're common sense. B, they're in God's word. We keep this Sabbath. It tells us to stop one day out of the week. Stop completely and don't do anything normal that you do during the rest of the week. You got six days. 
He says, but on this day, this is the Sabbath. Try to do as little as possible in terms of your body, health-wise. And that's one of the reasons I think the benefits of the Sabbath is resting and studying and thinking, using your head, not very little physical activity. So we should do everything we possibly can to prolong our life physically and then thus lower the odds of contracting some illness. Now, I'm wondering, you're wondering right about now, is he ever going to open up his Bible? Yes, we are. If you'll turn, please, to Psalm 146. This is a fairly short psalm, but it is so full of what we're talking about. It's very short, but it occupies a very distinct, distinct place in psalms. It's one of the Hillel Psalms, very important. There, there are many sets, and if you've ever studied the Psalms, each one of the Psalms has usually a certain type of characteristic. There, there are mournful Psalms. There are praise Psalms. There are Psalms of ascent for certain times of the year. Feast of Tabernacles, going up to the feast. This Hillel is a praise Psalm. Uh, it's traditionally felt to be written possibly by Haggai or Zechariah, but that's disputed. And there are whole schools of thought on studying just the Psalms. I've got a, a commentary just on the Psalms. It is yay thick, very, very thick, very detailed. And they look at the structure. And in fact, this, does, this, this Psalm does have great structure about it. As short as it is in the 10 verses, it has... It'll have a call to praise, verses 1 through 4. God as their creator, verses 5 and 6. It has the crux, or we call it a chiasm, where it comes to a point. Uh, verses 7 through 9 is, 9 is God as the sustainer. It goes back to the concept of God as the king, and it ends where exactly it begins with the praise to God. Let's read it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, he returns to his earth, and that very day his plans perish. Happy is he who is God of, the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps truth forever, executes justice for the oppressed, gives food to the hungry. The Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord braises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. But the way of the wicked, he turns upside down. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Now, I read that fairly quickly. And if you're like most people, as I read it, you stopped and lingered over a certain verse or a certain concept or a certain word. It said something to you. And that's the way the Psalms are. They're very truncated and very short, choppy sentences many times. And they sometimes stand on their own. In fact, there, there is a couple of verses here that are epically famous, and we'll go over them now in a little bit more detail. But as we read this, I'm going to remind you who you are. I'm going to remind you, as we did in the Bible study, by the way, we went through the book of Luke, and I asked the, the group to please consider themselves to whom the book was written. It was written to Theophilus. I'm going to ask you to remember who this is written to. It's written to God's people at that day, whether it's in David's day or Zechariah Haggai's day, but it's also God meant it for our day and to us. And if that's the case, I want you to put on both your New Testament head, brain, and your Old Testament head and brain. The entire knowledge of the Bible you will use, utilize, call upon, as we read this psalm. I'm not going to turn, but I may reference other concepts. But it will be dependent upon you, it will be dependent upon you to think up those concepts that you know to be true in the New Testament because it applies to us today. Each of the lives that we lead in this room are different. No two are the same. I'm always struck by that everywhere I go, and I'm sure you do where you go. No two people are alike. You don't look alike. You don't have the same skin color. You don't have the same hair color. You're not wearing the same clothes, same shoes, same socks, same tie, same dress. You don't have the same watch on. You're all different. You, were, you weren't, weren't all born in the same place. You weren't born in the same year. You don't live in the same house. 
Thank goodness we don't live in the same house. It'd be messy. But none of us are the same. We're utterly, completely different. And yet, we all came here. We all showed up at 3 o'clock for the Bible study at 2 o'clock. We all knew to come here because we hold these values in common. As different as we are, as very special and unique as we are, and we all are unique, we have some extremely simple and common, but very profound common understandings. I'm always struck by that. Down to your fingerprints. There's been a number of studies recently that, that fingerprints, some of them are similar, I think, but the overwhelming evidence is, by and large, they're not. It's very individual. We are all different, but we're all here together. Why are we all here together? We wish to serve and obey God, seek the truth, fellowship with others, and later, assuming uh, everyone will arrive from wherever we are, we will return home. Let's read these verses now. Verse 1 and 2, very slowly, purposefully. Praise the Eternal. Praise the Lord. It is where we get the word hallelujah. And you will see God's name. And if you want a wonderful, interesting search, God's name is used in four or five different ways here. It's even used with a, a, a pronoun. So every facet of God is used. Hallelujah. Praise the Eternal. O oh my soul. He, this is what we call a reflective phrase. He's saying this, the psalmist is. I will praise the Lord. While I live, look at the, again, more personal pronouns that the psalmist uses. While I live, I will praise the eternal. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. While I have breath, while I live, all my life, he says reflectively, I will praise God. I will praise him, give honor to him, whatever you, whatever you define that to mean. That God will be that important. So that's how the, the psalm starts with that word. This call to praise, hallelujah. It will end with exactly the same word when we're done. He goes on, he says, do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. Now that's an odd one, and we're going to see this over and over again of a contrast. The contrast, he begins to compare God with mankind. He says, first, there's two types. He says, there are princes. These are people who are in authority. He says, don't put your trust in princes. What would a prince be to the psalmist? That would be somebody in the government. We could retranslate that because we do not have a prince uh, over our government. We do not have a king over our government. We have people. They're elected officials, by and large, some appointed, over our government. But they're still in the government. And they lead us, or at least they think they're leading us, so they think they have authority. Romans tells us that we are to pray for them that have authority over us, Romans 13. But there is a very different aspect of their authority over us, and this psalm gets into it. And so these are people who have authority over you. Who has authority over your life? The government does. Once again, you go back to the 210 and you drive at 90 miles an hour, you'll find out real quickly who has authority over you. You'll get, you'll get pulled over so quickly and you'll get a ticket a mile long. You may even be arrested for exhibition of speed. You'll find out very quickly who has authority. What about the, the ministry? Does the ministry have authority over you? To a degree, like the government officials, they, they are an ordained authority to some degree. He says, do not put your trust in princes. Princes is an authority figure. He says, this is going to sound shocking and alarming to many of you, he says, don't put your trust in them. Don't put your trust in the federal government. That's easy. <laughs> Don't put your trust in the state government. That's even easier, much easier. But the word prince doesn't mean prince. It means do not put your trust in those men. In fact, as we'll see, don't put your trust in any man, any physical human being. He says, not in a son of man in whom there is no help. The word there, help, is a very, very important word. It's teshua. It means to help, to rescue, to save. He says, don't put yourself in that type of authority. Not ultimate authority, 
not in salvation or rescuing. In fact, no, no man, no woman, no human being for this type of salvation. The government cannot save you, I promise you. I promise you. It says right here, the government cannot save you. The United States will not give you salvation. You know what else? Ministers cannot save you. I haven't met one yet, and there's some very fine ministers, wonderful people, men that have given their lives. Sorry. Sorry. They cannot give you salvation. They can assist, but that's not what this verse says. There is no help, no salvation, true, ultimate, ultimate salvation. Oh, and by the way, the church cannot save. The church does not give salvation. You can wordsmith that all you want about Christ as the head of the church, the body. The church has an organization, not this church, not any church, can bring you salvation. Let's read it again. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. For, this is the reason, his spirit departs, he returns to his earth. In that very day, his plans perish. When we die, when we die, and we've had a number of unfortunate deaths. We had one last Sabbath in Las Vegas. Very sudden, unexpected, very unexpected. A younger man in his 50s. In the church, you'll be happy to hear, the church did uh, rally around both um, themselves and the family. Let's keep moving. We, they will die. His spirit departs. His plans perish. Everything that a, a person alive that is now dead wanted to do, it is over. All the hopes, all the dreams, all the desires are gone. When they're gone, not only his hopes and dreams and desires are gone, he or she, we, we take their physical possessions, we put them in a box or boxes, and we put them on a shelf. And we have great memories. Memories are, are wonderful things. I, I have memories and you have memories about many, many people who are no longer with us. And that's important. But relative to the individual, the individual human being, when they're dead, they're dead. Physically, aren't they? Now we know, we know where they will go. They will go ultimately. We know there is a future. We know from both Old Testament theology and we know from New Testament theology, but we want to stick to and focus on this psalm as it relates to its, its subject matter, and that is, who can save you? Who can help you? Whom should you put ultimate trust in? Why? Because they're mortal, they're physical, they're temporary. All the government programs, all the government plans, after the initiators have died, they're gone. May God be thanked. By the way, it takes propping up. And we talk about presidents and governments of old and what their programs were. They really don't last beyond the people that formed them, those that put them in law. They've always, they, they become morphed. And we always make the phrase in the United States, oh, that isn't according to what the founding fathers would have thought. So it even happens to them. The idea of this great nation is still here, but it is very, very different than what it was. So man is mortal. His plans, his governments, his endeavors are mortal. By the way, they are not meant to last because of what we see in the next verses. Verse 5. Verse 5. And the psalmist here, when he's talking, let's, before we get to verse 5, let's make sure we understand in this contrast to the psalm, he is talking about mortality. He is not talking about the resurrection of the just or the unjust. That's not the focus of this psalm. The focus of this psalm, and especially with the next verse, is contrast. Most psalms are. They will give this side, and then they will give another side. They will talk about one description, and then they will give a contrasting description. And it's supposed to, supposed to make us do one thing and one thing only. Think. Prayerfully, deeply think. And so, I can give you odds and everybody in this room. Barring Christ's return, Within the next two weeks, everyone in this room will be dead in 150 years. Think that's pretty good odds? That's pretty good odds. I know some of you think you're going to live forever. Yeah. 
That's before you hit 50. Then things change. So those are the odds. Is it a certainty? Let's read verses 3 and 4 again before we go to 5. Don't put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man, in whom there is no help. That's pretty all-encompassing. Not the government, nor an average individual, because the spirit departs, he returns to earth. In that day, his plans are done. They're buried with him. You want to see what uh, uh, the plans are of George Washington? Open his grave. That's where they are. Great man. Tremendous vision. And yes, in some theory, it, it does exist. Not like he envisioned it. Not like anyone envisions it. And yet there is only one and only one entity in whom we should be putting our ultimate trust. So let's read verses 5 and 6. Happy is he who has the God, El, of Jacob for his help. Same word. Remember the word help in 3, the help in 5. Verse 5. Whose hope is in the eternal his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them. So here's this contrast. Do not put your trust in man, mankind, his organizations. As wonderful as this church is, and I think this is God's church. It's not God's one and only true church, but I think we're part of the true church. It cannot save you. Please don't expect it to. And none of the ministry can. As much as you uh, give us respect and honor and you do, we cannot. The contrast is from the physical to the spiritual in verse 5. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the eternal, his God. Why? Remember we said who he was, now why? The why comes next. Who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them? Who keeps truth forever? Who executes justice for the oppressed? Who gives food to the hungry? Who, 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 four straight times. We'll see this pattern repeat itself again. Why? Because of who he is and what he's done and what he's created. What has God created through Jesus Christ? Everything you see, this physical shell, this piece of wood, I think, yeah, that Mr. Vieira built, this microphone, this Bible, God created everything. He created reality. He created all that we see. He made heaven and earth. That's it's pretty encompassing, isn't it? Heaven, earth. See what else is there? Not much. Not, not a whole lot after heaven and earth. The sea and all that is in them. Who keeps truth forever? With God, there is truth. And so it says we are to praise God. We're to trust God. That is in whom we put our trust. Now I want you to work with me here. I want you to, if you would, I know you've never been asked to do this in church, or very rarely in this one, just a few times during the year. I want you to take out of your pocket or purse, whatever you have, just take a couple minutes, and I'd like you to pull a coin out, whatever you got handy, or a bill, right? We heard about the difference between coins and bills. I don't care if there's coins or bills, just take one out, work with me please. Give me a minute. Now if you're married, ask your wife for some money. I had to. <laughs> and I want you to pull out, if, you, if you've got a, a coin or a bill, I've got a, a bill. Uh, some of you, 50s and 100s are fine. Have you, have you, most of you got them out now? Okay. Now you got them out. Could I have the deacons and ushers come by if you got your hands up in the air like that? No. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, I'm not. Yes, I am. Now, I want you to take, I'm only allowed, my wife said, you get a dollar bill. She said, this is your dollar bill for the week. This is, this is how my marriage has been going on for 38 years, right? A dollar, right? So I go to the 99 cent store. Take your dollar bill. George is on the front on a $1 bill. Uh, what's on the front of a 50? And I, knew, I knew some of you would know. I have no idea. Turn it over on the back. And it says right above the one on a dollar bill, it'll say something different on a coin. What does it say? Tell me. A little louder. Yeah, don't you wish they did. Don't you wish it were true. It's on our currency. It's, on, it's been on our currency for a long time. Not forever. But it says, this nation, in God we trust. I think that's a laudable thing. That's important. I, I, I do believe in British Israelism. To a great degree, I do believe God founded this country. It has a destiny. And we are supposed to trust in God. We carry around these bills. 
in a world, in a country of which 25 to 30 percent are atheists. We want to remove that. So um, if you want to take your money and just lay it here on the aisle, here the ushers will pick it up after services. We wish it were true, because we are God's people. So of all the people in the country, this country, that carry these bills and coins, we believe that, or we should. It's in God. It doesn't say anybody else. It doesn't say the government. It doesn't say Washington, D.C. It doesn't say Sacramento. In Sacramento and God, uh, maybe in that order, we trust. No, it says in God we trust, and that's important. It is God and God alone who is to be trusted. He alone is faithful because he is immortal. He has no beginning. He has no end. And he and his son, Jesus Christ, because that's what we read when we read God. In fact, if we do believe that God is the God of the Old Testament, it is basically talking about Christ as well here. They are without end. They are the ones to be trusted. The contrast to man who is created and God who we cannot comprehend. He is unfathomable. He made this, right? I have trouble making pizza. I have trouble making scrambled eggs. God made the universe. He is immortal. And so there's this contrast. He also is the one who keeps truth forever. From whom do we get truth? We get it from God. We do not get it from man. Man is merely an instrument. God is the source. We now come to this, the crux, we say the apex of this chiasm in verses 7 through 9. It says, who, he continues with the who's, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food for the hungry, the eternal gives freedom to the righteous. Now you'll see that the, the, the pronoun who has changed to the eternal, it's Yahweh. The eternal gives freedom to the prisoners. The eternal opens the eyes of the blind. The eternal raises those who are bowed down. The eternal loves the righteous. The eternal watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and the widow, but the way of the wicked he turns upside down. Isn't that fascinating? You may have a different translation, but that's literally what it means in the Hebrew. Some translations say frustrates. I like turns upside down. Notice these different groups. There's eight plus one. Nine types of lives, nine types of life events, different people, seemingly many of them in not too good a shape. They haven't had happy things happen to them. They haven't had fortunate things happen to them. The oppressed, the hungry, prisoners, the blind, bowed down, meaning crippled, the righteous, the alien, or the stranger, can these people, the blind, the poor, the hungry, the widow, we may know, we may know some. We may know many of these people in these situations. Can they be also righteous as well? Can you be poor and righteous? Absolutely you can. Poor is a relative term. Poor is a relative term. Crippled is a relative term. You're poor and somebody else's poor may be something completely different, but it's poor to them. It's poor to them. It's relative. Man has no absolutes. Everything to us is relative. Something's good, something's best, maybe better. It's relative. There are no absolutes. With God, there are absolutes. But God is dealing with people who have re relative things. But he says, and can you be poor? Can you be handicapped or crippled? Can you be oppressed and in prison? Are there blind, crippled, poor people in prison who are righteous? Why would God help somebody in prison who wasn't righteous? But look who does these things. He, he keeps truth. Verse 7, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The eternal gives freedom to the prisoners. The eternal opens the eyes of the blind. The eternal raises those who are, are bowed down. And he loves the righteous. He watches over the strangers, the aliens. He says we are strangers, all strangers, aren't we? We're all strangers in a strange land. And he says, God meets every one of these people in their own typical and in their location, wherever they are, whoever they are, wherever they are. There's no geographic restriction here. There's no, you have to be a certain height, certain weight, certain color. Your eyes have to be a certain color. You have to look like somebody. No, you're a prisoner, you're blind, you're bowed down. 
God loves the righteous, and that's important. Ah, I think, I love this phrase, I'll say it again, but he turns upside down the wicked. He flips them around. Notice the, the poetic nature of it, the visual you get. You get some wicked person, whoever that is, you can picture who you wish, and they're upside down. But you'll notice, by contrast, he's almost made the others right side up. He's made the others, he's bowed people who are bowed, he'd made them stand up. Possibly has opened the eyes of the, of the blind. And sometimes this can be literal, can't it? And sometimes it can be spiritual. He opens the eyes of the blind. That can mean somebody who is blind now can physically see. It could mean somebody who is spiritually blind can now spiritually see. And it says that God comes to all of them. I, uh, I was always... I'm always struck by the fact whenever we see the, the verse, who gives food to the hungry, gives freedom to the prisoners, those that are oppressed is, I think of those people in our society when all of us are sitting very nicely inside this, this beautiful building that God has allowed us to be in. And we have all these nice clothes on. I had no trouble finding a tie. I have more than one tie. Uh, thank goodness I have more than one shirt. I have more than one pair of shoes or socks, right? My clothes are clean. I had a car to drive here in. I got to meet with you. I'm a very blessed person, right? I imagine some of you are equally as blessed, some more than others, but we're all blessed. But I had no trouble getting here. It was, I complain about the traffic. I know Becky, constrained Becky. I know I complain a lot about the, the traffic. I hate traffic. But there are people who don't have a car. They don't have a tie to pick from at all. They don't have a, a good, pair of clothes. They have nothing. And they live among us. Um, while we were in Vegas, I was looking up some information on Vegas. They're going to hear it again if they're on the webcast. Uh, ABC News reported a while back that in the 1990s, Las Vegas began building storm drainage tunnels to protect, to protect the tourist destination from raging flash floods. So in other words, under all those casinos are these huge tunnels. You can see pictures of them. Just Google Las Vegas tunnels. And that's where the water during a flash flood was supposed to go under the, the city during a flash flood. And they've been building these for about 20 years. Currently, the plan was to construct 1,000 miles of tunnels within 20, 25 years. And they're, they're on their way, and they're still building them. Today, the tunnels house 15,000 homeless. Yeah. So what do you pray? What doesn't happen? A flood. It'll wipe out 15,000 people. They're living under the city. Isn't that, what a contrast that is, I thought of that. These beautiful skyscrapers, and I don't begrudge the businesses that built those. They did so legally, I guess. And, uh, but under them, but under them, there are people that have nothing. Millionaires and nothing. And that's the society we live in. It is mind-boggling. There are 40,000 homeless in Orange County. Have a hazard a guess on LA? 100,000. About the size, just three quarters the size of Pasadena. An entire city of homeless. What are the odds that you will be poor? Relatively speaking. What are the odds that you will be bowed down or crippled or infirmed? My mouth to God's ear, may it never happen. What are the odds that you will be hungry? What are the odds that you'll need long-term care? What are the odds? What are the odds, we used to say in financial services, odds are you're going to live a long life. Odds are you're going to get sick. Odds are. Odds are things happen. But I want you to note the verses again. It's what God does in a relative sense to us, but it's absolute to him. He executes justice. He gives food to the hungry. He gives freedom to the prisoners. He opens the eyes of the blind. He raises those who are bowed down. He allows people to live in some way, shape, or form in many ways. It's what God will do and what he will do to the wicked. And it's who we should put our ultimate trust in. Unfortunate things are going to happen to bad people. It happens to all of us. One of the good things about the ministry are many is that we, we know that God is, is our help. The bad news is we sometimes hear a lot of sad things, unfortunately. That God is, 
helping other people get through these things. That's the sad part. There are many people in God's church who are suffering horribly. They don't talk about it. We can't talk about it. But know that they do. And it's important that you understand that. God doesn't say, I don't know who these people are. Yes, he does. He knows who these people are. And it's us. He says he gives God's people help. And somehow, some way, he, we get through it. Today we live in a world of contrasts. The odds are not good, we will always do well. The odds are not good, we will always do well. The odds are we will not always eat well. For if the prophecies of the church are correct, things are going to get very, very bad before they get very, very good. And so there will be some great valleys that we will all have to go through, and hopefully we all go through them together. But I think it's a psalm like this, which seems so very short, which has so much in it. Now those contrasts should give us a couple of concluding thoughts. One, it should give us pause to remember. We remember of our lives and the people around us because the odds are certain our lives will be relatively brief. No one in this room physically will live 500 years. Our lives are brief. The odds are we will face adversity. The odds are we will suffer some way, somehow, physically or mentally. But it should remind us that we should be compassionate as much as we can on other people because either we have gone through it or because they have. Do you recall what you and I have seen all our lives, whether you've had a very short life or a very, very long life? Those of us that have seen more and more as we get older I think we should recall more, remember more, and unfortunately, young people, we're going to remind you all often of what we've gone through, but also to be very, very grateful because we either are the ones above ground. We are the ones that are here today. We are the ones that can fellowship after church, and we welcome uh, all our visitors and obviously everyone that attends here regularly to, visit, to fellowship with us to be grateful for we know that God and his son Jesus Christ per this psalm it's even on our money and by the lives that you've all lived that God has been there over and over and over again not always in the way that we want him to be it hasn't turned out maybe the way we wished but it was the way God had your life according to his plan so we know that God and his son will be there and based on those facts those, those pieces of data and what we have seen, what we know, whom we have loved, God will be there, is there, and will always be there around us and for us. That's pretty good odds. 